No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America. Episode 9, The North. You haven't heard our thunder yet. Slogan at a protest against SB 1070, Tucson, Arizona, 2010. Immigrants. The corporate, governmental, and criminal elites that benefit from the suffering on the border are ruthless and powerful. But they are not gods. They aren't the only actors in this drama, and they don't have the situation completely under control. People make it through the desert because they are brave and resourceful, not just because the Border Patrol lets them. The trails themselves are extraordinary testaments to human ingenuity, weaving gracefully through canyons and over mountains with an unerring eye for direction and cover. There are nearly 12 million undocumented people in this country. Working in the desert has underscored for me that they are not all the same. The migrants are not all angels, or devils, or victims. They are not passive objects that are acted upon by the world without acting in return. They are complex individuals who have chosen to take their lives into their own hands, and I have chosen to take their side as best as I can. Sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you beat the man, and sometimes the man beats you. We were walking up a small canyon. One of my companions was doing a very loud and rather florid call out. Compañeras! Compañeros! No tengan miedo! Tenemos agua, comida y medicamentos! Somos amigos! No somos la migra! Estamos aquí para ayudarles! Si necesitan cualquier cosa, grítenos! The great majority of the time, no one is there to hear these call outs. We turned a corner in the canyon, and there were about 35 people. Men, women, children, and teenagers, dressed in all blacks, browns, and desert tans, dead silent and taking up a very small amount of space. Holy shit! Uh, did you hear us coming? Yeah, we heard you coming. It was very hot. We gave them lots of water, food, socks, and treated a number of blisters and sprained ankles. They were all from Guatemala. They said they had been together every step of the way. As we prepared to part ways, one of them handed us a large sack of money. Pesos, quetzales, and dollars. Um, no, you don't understand. You don't have to give us any money. This is why we are here. No, it's you who does not understand, he said. We found this money at a shrine in the desert. We decided it was not doing anybody any good there, so we took it. If the migra catch us, they will take it from us and it will never do anybody any good. We want you to take this money and to use it to help other migrants. We carried out their wishes. The border doesn't end at the border. And the hardships that undocumented people face don't stop there either. The border cuts through every city and state. It cuts through many of our own bodies. The line in the sand is neither the first nor the last twist of the meat grinder that global capitalism has prepared for people without papers. After crossing the border, undocumented people enter a world in which they cannot legally earn money. They have compelling reasons not to call an ambulance, go to the hospital, obtain health or automobile insurance, drive a vehicle, open a bank account, use a credit card, apply for a mortgage, sign a lease, or rely on any number of other options that people with citizenship can fall back on. If for any reason you have made it a practice to live a portion of your life off the books, you might be able to appreciate how hard it is to do so full-time in this society. The most telling term in the lexicon of migration in North America is pollo. I avoid the word like the plague, but it's widely used by everyone involved in the human trafficking industry on both sides of the law and border, from the top on down. Undocumented people are pollos walking meat. It's perfect. If marijuana smugglers are used as beasts of burden, 
Migrants and refugees are driven like cattle to the slaughter. All are hunted like wild game. Here's the thing, though. People will not be treated like animals. Actually, animals will not be treated like animals either, not if they can help it. Anyone who has ever had to reason with a recalcitrant donkey or flee from an angry bull can attest to this. Undocumented people are indeed the victims of this story, but they are also the victors. They are subject to forces beyond their control, but they are also the subject of history. For millions of people worldwide, illegal immigration is a legitimate form of resistance to the inequities of global capitalism. It is the most effective action that many people can take to change the conditions in which they live. It may be indirect resistance, but it gets the goods in two specific ways. First, it is effective economically. Remittances from immigrant workers in the United States, many of them undocumented, to their families in Mexico, totaled more than $24.8 billion in 2015 alone, plus $6.25 billion from Guatemalans, $4.28 billion from Salvadorans, and $3.4 billion from Hondurans. If you add up all the remittances from immigrant workers in the entire global north to all of their families in the entire global south, the total starts to look pretty significant. It's filtered through a fine screen of work and exploitation. But all the same, this money represents one of the largest redistributions of wealth from the rich to the poor in the entire course of human history. This is a big deal in the here and now. Second, it is effective demographically. South to north immigration, much of it illegal, is bringing about real demographic shifts in parts of the global north, and particularly in the United States. This shift may eventually lead to meaningful changes within this country, which could contribute to a somewhat more equitable restructuring of the global economic system, which would mitigate the tremendous disparity in wealth between the global north and south, which is what drives the migration in the first place. It's certainly not a given that this latter hope will pan out. Generations of immigrants have moved from the margins into the mainstream of American society without radically changing its character. In fact, this is exactly how settlers took control of the land to begin with. Nonetheless, a distinctive feature of American history is that this pathway has generally been reserved for immigrants of European ancestry. It has not yet been proven that this country can assimilate or segregate the current influx of non-European immigrants without eventually undermining the foundation of white supremacy upon which it has been built. We got a call from our neighbors. A man had crawled up to their door. He was in terrible shape. He could barely stand or talk. He had not eaten or drunk water for three days, and he hadn't urinated for a day and a half. It had been deadly hot. We tried to give him fluids, but he would vomit immediately every time. This is really bad, I told him. You need an IV. We don't have one here. You may have kidney damage. We can't treat that. You need to go to a hospital. They will deport you after they treat you, but if you don't, I'm really afraid that you might die. No, he said, don't call them. Please, I understand, but no, don't call them. But no. We laid him down. After several hours, he managed to keep down a tiny amount of water. We nursed him through the night as best as we could, giving him water every hour or so. By morning, he was able to hold it down without vomiting, and he finally urinated a little bit. He could barely sit up, but he was able to talk again. I've never seen anyone so sick refuse to go to the hospital, I said. What happened to you? I've lived in the States for 18 years, he told us. I've never been in any trouble. I've never even gotten a parking ticket. My wife and I finally paid off our house. All my children are here, so are my grandchildren. For work, I take care of elderly people. Six months ago, I had an accident and I broke my back. I was in bed for nearly four months. I was working again and I got pulled over. The policeman said I didn't use my turn signal. I've been here 18 years and I've never got pulled over. I've always been very careful. But they sent me to a detention facility. They kept me there for 15 days with chains on my hands and feet. They fed us peanut butter crackers three times a day. 
I was shackled the whole time. They dropped me off across the border with nothing. I had nowhere to go. I hadn't been there in so long. I left with a group that night. They drove us way out into the desert. We walked for three days. I couldn't keep up any longer. I am not a young man anymore. They left me out there with no food or water, and I was by myself for three more days. I had no idea where I was. I drank dirty water from a cattle pond, and it made me even sicker. I was hearing voices and seeing things. When I saw that house up there, I didn't know if it was real or not. I kept walking towards it, and I thought I might have already died. I can't do this again. My whole life is here. There is nothing for me in the world if I can't make it back. If I die, I die. This is my only chance. I have to keep going. He recovered slowly. He called us from his house a week after he left. A month later, he and his wife sent down a huge package of shoes and food and clothing to give to other migrants. I almost always stay inside, he said. I can't afford to risk being sent back. I suffered so much out there. I'm still healing. I know that I could never make it another time. I am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed it might be done. John Brown, on his way to the gallows, December 2nd, 1859. The impending demographic change in the United States is a cause of real anxiety for some powerful Americans, as well as many less powerful ones who have not managed to think all the way through its ramifications. As far as I'm concerned, the sooner it comes, the better. In my opinion, even a partial erosion of white supremacy in the United States is actually in the long-term self-interest of most white Americans, such as myself. You can build a throne out of bayonets, but you can't sit on it for long. Aside from the fact that subjugating other people is a rotten thing to do, it's not a very safe way to live. It's extraordinarily impressive that black people in the United States managed to break free from both slavery and Jim Crow without resorting to indiscriminate slaughter of white people on a grand scale. It certainly would have been understandable to do so, and arguably it would have been justified. I suspect that things would have been much uglier if there had not been at least a few white people who were willing to do the right thing. I don't know if I want to bet that the billions of people that are being pushed around the world today will be so restrained when it comes time to pay the piper on a global level. It seems better to get on the winning side while there still may be time. In any case, the wheels are coming off the bus. We live on the same small planet as everybody else. The way of life we inherited has proven disastrous for the biosphere and for the long-term prospects of human survival. My generation is perhaps the first group of white Americans that not only have an ethical mandate to turn away from this path, but also an urgent self-interest in doing so. Left unchecked, the current arrangement is guaranteed to cannibalize what is left of our land base within our lifetimes and leave our children with nothing but the bones. Admittedly, this is complicated. Groups of humans have subjugated other groups of humans and destroyed their land bases since long before the social construct of whiteness ever existed, and people of European ancestry are not the only ones who are capable of doing either of these things. White supremacy is not the only linchpin holding this all together, but it is a significant one. At this point, I don't think we can hope to stop the devastation of our planet without contesting the structures of white supremacy, or vice versa. So the answer is not for white Americans to continue to defend the indefensible at the price of our souls, or to crawl into a hole and die. It is for those of us who fit that description to think carefully about where our allegiance really lies, and to find ways to act on it in materially meaningful ways. There are examples throughout history of people who did just this, members of oppressor and colonizer groups who decided to throw in their lot with the colonized and oppressed. You can point to white people involved in the Underground Railroad during slavery, Gentiles who sheltered Jews during the Holocaust, white Americans who took part in the Civil Rights Movement, white South Africans who resisted apartheid, 
Americans involved in the sanctuary movement during the wars in Central America in the 1980s, and Israelis resisting the occupation of Palestine today, to name a few. It's a good story to be part of. Those of us who are positioned to do so should embrace it and be proud of it. Our opponents will call us traitors, as if we support another government. In fact, we have pledged our allegiance to something older and wiser than anything that any nation-state has to offer. And it is the apologists for the current order who have turned their backs and lost their way. Working on the border has shown me time and again that you really can't extricate one part of the equation from all the other parts. Once you start untangling one thread, you find that it's tied into a noose wrapped around your own neck. The drug war will not end without structural change throughout Mexico which will not happen without structural change in Colombia and the other cocaine-producing countries, which will not happen without structural change in the United States, and so on. You can reverse the order of these statements, or add others, and they will still be true. So, for example, fighting internal deportations and fighting border militarization are not two distinct projects. This has global implications, but it is especially true in the case of Mexico, the United States, and their devil child, the border. Nothing will get better on the border without things changing in both countries, and the problems in one country will not be solved without addressing the problems in the other. Once, I asked this Oaxacan guy what he thought it would take to end the death in the desert. Una revolución binacional, he answered, without hesitating. We laughed, because of course that is impossible. For now. New volunteers sometimes ask me what I think a just border policy would look like. I tell them that there is no such thing. It is a contradiction in terms. I am not interested in helping the authorities figure out how to fix the mess they've created. Ultimately, the only hope for a solution to the border crisis lies in bringing about worldwide systemic change that ensures freedom of movement for all people, rejects the practice of state control over territory, honors indigenous autonomy and sovereignty, addresses the legacies of slavery and colonization, equalizes access to resources between the global north and global south, and fundamentally changes human beings' relationship to the planet and all the other forms of life that inhabit it. (laughs) That's a tall order. Where to start? The desert is not the only place, but it is one. The strength of our work is that there is no doubt that we are having a tangible effect on the lives of individual people who find our water, our food, or us. I know many people who I am certain would have died were it not for the resources that we offered, and many more who made it back to their families that never would have been able to do so without meeting us. I don't say this to pat myself on the back, but to say that it is possible to start somewhere. People sometimes lament the fact that it can feel like we are just serving as a band-aid, This word always aggravates me, because the stakes are too high and the metaphor is not strong enough. One life means a lot to the person who lives it. Tourniquet, I tell them. You mean you don't want us to just serve as a tourniquet? Nevertheless, the weakness of our work is that we are always dealing with the symptoms and never the cause. It can feel like we're always cleaning up a mess we didn't create, like a child trying to mend the damage an abusive parent is doing to the rest of the family. It's better than nothing, but what we really need to do is to stop the abuse. Many of the most effective types of direct action can end up looking like some version of damage control. The problem is that it's easier to make attainable goals and quantify success when dealing with individuals than when dealing with a system. I can visualize the steps from A to Z of how to drop 25 gallons of water on a trail. When I wake up in the morning, there's always something that I can do to move towards that goal. I have a much harder time visualizing how to get Border Patrol out of the desert, and a harder time still imagining how to affect structural economic change on a global scale. It can be tempting to say that it's better to succeed at what we can do than fail at what we can't, but that's just defeatism. I really don't want to be doing these same water drops 25 years from now. So what should we do? Thankfully, none of us has to do everything. It's not my job to act like Moses and set the people free. That's not how meaningful social change happens. I can do my best to help, but if people are going to get free, they are going to do it themselves. I simply can't call the shots in other people's struggles for liberation. 
I trust that millions of people who are most directly affected by immigration and border enforcement will keep finding ways to combat it. There will almost certainly be things that white U.S. citizens can do if we keep our ears to the ground. If my efforts in the desert are in any way contributing to $39 billion moving from the rich to the poor every year, then I'm happy. Ulises limped into camp with his full weight on a tree branch, dragging his right leg behind him. Is your leg broken? we asked him. He was young and skinny. No, he answered. I only have one leg. My prosthetic foot is broken. Sure enough, his leg was amputated above the knee. He had walked all the way from Altar, six days over the mountains. His foot had finally given out on the fourth day. I had never seen anything like this. Whoa, dude. I knew a guy that knew a guy, and I made some phone calls. We need a foot, I told him, with a quickness. Two days later, there was a package waiting in Tucson. Inside it was a foot. I drove back to camp, and Ulises was doing the dishes. There was a group of 12 men in the kitchen. I don't trust these guys, he told me under his breath. Some of these dudes are shifty. We haven't told them I've only got one leg. They think it's broken or something. We've got to switch it out in the trailer where they can't see. He was limping terribly. I got the package from the truck, and the 12 men watched us walk into the small pop-up trailer. Ulises had an Allen key to loosen the screw that held on his foot. We both pried on it, but the screw was rusted solid in place. Fuck, he said, we need some WD-40. I got some out of the truck in front of the 12 men. He sprayed it around the screw until the trailer filled up with fumes. We both pried and pried, but it would not budge. Motherfucker, he said, we need a ratchet set. I got one out of the truck, and the 12 men watched me return to the trailer. No matter what we did, the screw would not move. Motherfucking son of a bitch, he said. We need a pipe. I found a long pipe in front of the 12 men. He put the pipe over the ratchet handle. We braced against each other and pulled. The screw broke free. Ulisa slammed the new foot into place and tightened everything down. He started to pace in circles inside the tiny trailer. Oh yeah, this is a good one. I'm good to go. I'm good to go. He then stomped out of the trailer and back into the kitchen to finish the dishes, walking quickly and confidently. I can only imagine what it must have looked like to the 12 men. By all appearances, I had laid hands on him in the trailer and healed his broken leg with WD-40, a ratchet set, and a pipe. They left later that evening. Ulises was from Chiapas. Man, look, he told me over dinner. My town fucking sucks. There's only two things in my town. Bananas and dead people. I'm not kidding. Look up the front page of the newspaper if you don't believe me. Bananas and dead people. That's what you'll see. The mafias are killing everybody down there. Anyway, I was seeing this girl, right? I was really in love with her. We'd been together for a long time. We were going to get married and everything. But I didn't have any money and I didn't want to work on the banana plantation, and I didn't want to work for the mafia, and there's nothing else you can do down there. So I went to Mexico City to make some money so that we could get married, and I saved up a bunch of money, and I went back home, and she had gotten married to this other dude. Oh man, I said. And then he continued, well, I was pretty sad. So I was at this party, and I was dancing with this other girl, and well, you know, I got her pregnant. She's due in two months. Hmm. But we barely know each other, right? She doesn't want to be with me. I don't want to be with her. Her parents are pissed. They fucking hate me. They don't want her to have anything to do with me. And meanwhile, I can't even walk around town without seeing the girl that I really love. And she's with this other guy. So I was like, you know what? I'm done with this place. I'm going to the United States. I'll send money home to my son when he's born, and maybe when he grows up, he won't have to pick bananas or kill somebody for the mafia. Damn. Pretty soon, I realized that Ulises was really, really smart. Sharp. Sharp, like only one-legged teenagers from violent and depressing small towns in southern Mexico can be. He was incredibly observant, and he remembered everything. 
When he was ready to leave, we walked up the hill above camp. It was blazingly hot. He was going to walk to Tucson four more days at least. I told him everything I knew. The arroyos, mountains, hills, landmarks, time, distance, north, south, east, west. Everything from Mexico to Phoenix. No small amount of information. He nodded grimly without saying a word. When I was done, he repeated it all back to me, succinctly and accurately, with a few cogent questions thrown in. I know he was going to make it. Within a week, he sent word that he was at his uncle's house in Oakland. I looked up the paper from his hometown, bananas and dead people on the front page. Things didn't work out with his uncle. Ulises needed somewhere to stay. He ended up living with old friends of mine, and he would regularly send me hilarious updates about their punk bands and four-dimensional love lives. He seemed happy. Six months later, the mother of his son was murdered in his hometown. Ulises dropped everything and flew home to Chiapas to help her mother raise the baby. I lost touch with him, as did everyone I know. I always wondered what happened to him. One day, five years later, I was in Tucson and I got a message from camp. You've got to come down here. There's a guy with one leg asking about you by name. He walked in with an Honduran family, a 13-year-old girl, a 17-year-old boy, and a 55-year-old man. You should have seen him. He threw his hat down on the ground and started jumping around and waving his arms and was like, I knew it! I knew it! I told you we'd make it! I knew we could find this place! I drove out to camp. I could not believe my eyes. Ulises! Ulises! What happened? He had filled out a little and he didn't look like a kid anymore. Listen, man, he told me. My son is with his grandmother. We get along pretty well now. We decided it would be best for me to come back here to work. I went up to Altar and got with a group. We got split up by a chopper just north of the border. Same shit as always. And the fucking guide ran off like usual. I got away with these three Hondurans. I told him, look, there's this place somewhere out here where they'll help us. We can get food and water and medicine and sleep. It's been five years and I'm not exactly sure where we are, but I think I can find it. If you want to come with me, you can. We spent six days in the mountains. I spent every minute thinking about that conversation we had on the hill up there. I tried to remember every word you said. I was thinking so hard that smoke was coming out of my ears. We went in circles a little bit, but we made it. We walked right down the driveway. I did it, man. I found you guys again. I am still in awe of Ulises. He found our camp in the vast expanse of the Sonoran Desert from memory, after five years without a phone or a map or a GPS, and he led three people to safety who otherwise easily could have died. Not one person in a million would have been willing and able to do that. The Border Patrol can pin as many medals to their chests as they feel like, and these politicians can wrap themselves in the flag, whatever. Ulises is a real American hero. He's working in the United States now, sending money home to his son. Resistance. With that caveat, dear reader, that none of us has to do everything, please permit me to address you directly. The death in the desert is not the only messed up thing in the world, but it is pretty bad, and it hits close to home for me. I would really like to see it end. I encourage you to find a way to get involved. I can't tell you exactly how to do this. Coming to work in the desert is one way. There are many others. There are communities of undocumented people in nearly every part of the country, if not the world. What is the situation in your area, and what might you have to offer? There are institutions that benefit from this whole catastrophe in nearly every part of the country as well. What might you be able to do? Some have suggested that in order to link systemic change with tangible goals, we must find points of intervention in the system where we can apply power to leverage transformation. These points of intervention include the point of production, the point of destruction, the point of consumption, the point of decision, and the point of assumption. It's not perfect, but it's as good a framework as any to use when thinking about how to intervene in this particular situation. What might direct action at the point of production look like? Stalling the construction of new core civic facilities? What about at the point of destruction? 
finding ways to interfere with border patrol and ICE operations or intervene in deportations? How about the point of consumption? Pressuring businesses to commit to non-compliance with anti-immigrant laws and organizing boycotts of ones that refuse. The point of decision? Interrupting meetings or legislative processes? What might direct action at the point of assumption look like? What lies and assumptions are used to justify the dehumanization of immigrants? How might you be able to counter them? Do you have other ideas? Direct action in the context of humanitarian aid in the desert is a relatively new field, all things considered. There are many tactics yet to be developed, and many proven tactics that have not been pushed to their limits. There is still much to learn, and much that new people can offer. Most promisingly, the transnational, cross-cultural, and intergenerational alliances that have been forged in the crucible of the border have yet to approach their full potential. Our ability to realize this potential will determine the extent of the success of our campaign to end migrant deaths in the desert, as well as whether that campaign ever develops into a deeper resistance to the systems at the root of the problem. They haven't heard our thunder yet. I don't generally get too excited about actions in which people get arrested on purpose. That goes against all my hustling ethics, says Lupe Fiasco, and I usually agree. Civil disobedience is widely fetishized in the United States, even though it does not always produce the most desirable results. However, like any other tactic, it can be quite effective under the right circumstances. For example, on October 11, 2013, two groups of people chained themselves to two G4S, formerly Wacken Hut, buses, full of 70 detainees headed for Operation Streamline hearings at the federal courthouse in Tucson, Arizona. Another group chained themselves together inside the courthouse itself. This story requires some context. Operation Streamline is a joint initiative of the Department of Homeland Security and Department of Justice, started in 2005, that adopts a zero-tolerance approach to unauthorized border crossing. In contrast to previous policy, immigration violations are processed under the criminal justice system. First-time offenders are prosecuted for misdemeanor illegal entry, which carries a six-month maximum sentence. Anyone who has been deported in the past and is caught re-entering can be charged with felony re-entry, which carries a two-year sentence but can involve up to a 20-year maximum if the person has a criminal record. Over 99% of people streamlined plead guilty because those who do so are likely to get shorter prison terms, whereas those who don't are likely to get close to the maximum sentence. Another distinguishing feature is that cases are not heard individually, but rather are processed in one large group. A single case in the Tucson courthouse can include up to 70 defendants. The group cases typically take from 30 minutes to two and a half hours to decide, meaning from 25 seconds to two minutes per defendant. Furthermore, defense attorneys are typically afforded no longer than 30 minutes per client for consultations, which take place on the morning of the trial. These consultations are held in the open, in the very same courtroom that will later hold the in-mass trial. This is all of dubious legality at best, but they've been happily doing it every business day for years. Business is good. Bear in mind that people are regularly sent to prison for years in these kangaroo courts. I'm no fan of legal proceedings, period. But even by normal standards, Streamline is a travesty of justice. Strictly speaking, it's a failure of due process. The clear objective of all of this is to pull more people into the legal system. The end result is that tens of millions of taxpayer dollars are funneled to private prison industries that warehouse detainees, to G4S, for example. Streamline was brought to a full stop in Tucson on the day of the bus action. It took the police long enough to figure out how to deal with the situation that all hearings for the day had to be canceled. There was then no way to bring the detainees back in for trial because the court has 70 more people booked for the next day, and the next, and the next, and into infinity. All detainees on both buses were eventually deported without criminal prosecution because the government was unable to provide them a speedy trial under the letter of the law. 
The government then tried but ultimately failed to convict the participants in the action of various charges. The defendants in the case were eventually sentenced to 14 hours in jail, time served, no fees. There's some disagreement about the efficacy of the action, however, because an abnormally high percentage of the detainees were then laterally deported. For context, lateral deportation is another questionably legal practice that the government has been engaged in for years. The idea is to send a deportee not to the closest border city, to the place where they were apprehended, but to somewhere very far away. The Department of Homeland Security was especially fond of delivering people to northeastern Mexico in the early 2010s when it was basically a war zone. Being laterally deported from Nogales to Matamoros in those years was a bit like getting picked up for a drunk in a public charge in San Francisco and being dropped off in Baghdad at midnight after having been relieved of your wallet. Because of this, some people argued that the negative impacts of the G4S lockdown outweighed the positive ones. Others weren't convinced that the two events were related. Still others pointed out that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, and there's no way around this. As far as I know, however, most people do agree on this. At the end of the day, 70 people were never criminally prosecuted who otherwise certainly would have been, meaning that up to 70 people never went to prison who otherwise were headed directly there. So the action cost its participants very little and the benefits were great. That's a good outcome. The tactic could easily be replicated or improved upon by people into this sort of thing. Eventually, the law of diminishing returns would kick in, police tactics would improve, fines and sentences would increase, the definition of a speedy trial would change, and so on. But it would be effective for a while. When it ceased to be effective, the participants could develop alternatives and the battleground would move again. I'll conclude with two points. First, supply chain management is always at the heart of military logistics. Longer and more complex supply chains are always more susceptible to disruption, and the supply chain of the American government's one-sided war on undocumented people is long and complex indeed, and highly susceptible to disruption. Second, it is possible to assess the effectiveness of most actions by running a simple cost-benefit analysis. How can we get the maximum output, benefit, or payout for the minimum input, risk, or cost? The bus lockdown was a good example of this going well. There's an infinite field of possibility awaiting further experimentation. Vivir para ser libres o morir para dejar de ser esclavos. Live to be free, or die to no longer be slaves. Graffiti, quoting Praxedis Guerrero, on the south side of the border wall. Nogales, Sonora. You've just listened to episode 9 of No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America, published by the Crime Think X Workers Collective. Stay tuned next week for episode 10, From East to West, Part 1, Chaos and Order and Transformation. This audiobook is a production of the X Worker Podcast Collective. You can check us out at crimethink.com slash podcast. To order a print copy of the book, read a free PDF version online, check out the poster that accompanies the book, or to learn more about the anarchist struggle for a world without borders, visit crimethink.com slash borders. To learn more about No More Deaths and solidarity work in the desert along the U.S.-Mexico border, visit nomoredeaths.org.